Okay. Yeah. Hello, everybody, and a warm welcome to our event today in the Food for Climate Pavignon. Um, it's an exciting topic, and it's an important topic we are talking about, which is on true cost accounting as a tool for food systems transformation under climate conditions. We have a very exciting uh, panel. We have the speakers here in the room and we have four speakers, uh, three speakers online. It looks like it works, everything. Everybody is online, it looks good. Uh, just let me start. Um, we are facing a triple crisis. We have a climate crisis, we have a biodiversity crisis and we have a food crisis. And in this context, it's more than urgent also to discuss the transformation of food systems. The TCA, the true cost accounting, is one of the instruments and the brooches which could help us on um, this on to find a response to the climate, biodiversity, and food crisis. And I'm very happy to have one of the experts on TEEP here in the room, Alexander Müller. Alexander Müller is the co-founder of TMG Think Tank, and he is a former FAO assistant. Uh, Director General and State Secretary, and he was State Secretary for the Consumer Comp Protection, Food and Agriculture in Germany. And he also was involved in the uh, TIP APRI report. Uh, Alexander will give us an introduction in the hidden cost of food, and he will illustrate why food system transformation is necessary to achieve a 1.5 target. Over to you, Alexander, and uh, over. I think you will share your presentation from your own screen. Thanks a lot, Martina, for the welcome. I hope you can see my screen and we could uh, what see I see you, but we don't hear you very loud. Can you hear me now better? Okay, I'll, I'll try to do my very best. Thanks a lot okay. for, for the invitation. And thanks especially for putting this complex topic on the agenda. L let me say it very frank. Without food system transformation, we are not going to achieve the sustainable development goals and not going to achieve the Paris Climate Agreement. So food system transformation is an absolute must. The question is, how are we going to do it? What I'm going to present here is three topics in one 10 minutes presentation. I want to present why we need to talk about the true cost of food, and please don't mix it up with prices. True cost of food is analyzing real but economically hidden costs of food. We are looking at food system as a whole. It does not make sense to transform only parts of the system. We need a systems approach. And not only because this meeting takes place at the UNFCCC COP, we are looking, we have to look at climate change. And therefore, I would like to start with a very brief description of the problem. And I would like to refer back to some groundbreaking work that has been done more than 10 years ago by Nadia Shalaba in FAO, where we were looking at the question of how can we really look at the climate impact of food and not. So at this time, food waste was not a topic at the international level. And the study commissioned found out that we are wasting one third of all food. And if you look at the climate impact, and I can tell you there was a lot of resistance in the beginning. If you look at the climate impact, you could see that food waste, if it would be a country, it would have been the third biggest emitter in the world. So it would have to have a seat at the table when it comes to climate change mitigation and adaptation. And this is only an example why food is so very important to look at. But I would like to go beyond this. If we look at the true costs of our food system, I would like to present a very rough estimate of the externalities, the hidden costs of our food. A very rough estimate of the market value of our global food system is it has a value of around 10 trillion US dollars. 
And then if you look at the hidden costs of it, you will find out that you have huge amount of health costs. You have obesity, undernutrition, and pollution, pesticides, and, and uh, AMR, antimicrobial uh, resistances. But you also have environmental impacts, greenhouse gas emissions. You are destroying natural capital. And in the end, we are also destroying social cohesion in rural areas, and we have food loss and waste and fertilizer leakage. If you sum it up, the global food system has a value of 10 trillion US dollar, but it creates hidden costs of 12 trillion dollar. And therefore, my first message to all of us is, if we are talking about food system transformation and climate change, Let's have an integrated approach, look at the health costs, the environmental costs, including climate change, but also at the costs for poor rural communities. Currently, our food creates a lot of externalities. So what are we doing with true cost accounting? Let me present what we are doing. First, we have to identify significant externalities and dependencies. And again, we are looking at real costs, but costs that are in the current economic system invisible. Second, we are looking at how to measure the external effects and to assess their extent. Then we are looking at the values of these impacts, including the dependencies, in order to make them comparable. And last but not least, we are doing reporting the results in an understandable way. And of course, we always have to look at the audience we are talking to. And therefore, my second message is that without transforming food systems and without looking at the externalities and the dependencies, we might risk that even reduction of greenhouse gas emissions might have a negative impact on biodiversity. And therefore, we have to have the integrated approach. If you are interested in it, and Martina knows it very well because WWF courses and, and TMG, we, we are working together in assessing diets. You can look at our publicly available True Cost Accounting Agri-Food Handbook that provides you a deeper insight. So we are looking in the assessment we have done together with big companies on different capitals. Natural capital, it starts with climate, soil, resource scarcity, ecosystems. It goes to human capital, human health, looking at the health impacts of pesticides, looking at working conditions and occupational health and safety, looking at what do farmers earn, what do workers on the field earn. We're looking at working conditions. And we are also looking, of course, at human rights and gender discrimination. This coherent approach gives us a broad overview about our food system. Now people say, you with your true cost accounting, you want to make food even more expensive. And now food is already very expensive. I have to say, cheap food today is very expensive if we consider the externalities. If we go to the supermarket, we pay for food. Their food is very often cheap, but we pay overall four times for our food. We pay in the supermarket, we pay, this is the wallet number two, with our health, obesity, malnutrition, with the, the, the costs for the health care. We are looking with the environmental degradation. And we are also paying with the loss of social cohesion and, and with a decrease of, of welfare of people living in rural areas. And therefore, don't look at prices only in the food, uh, supermarket. This is only part of the equation. We can go far beyond because we are paying for our food four times. And therefore, my key message is that with all the technical things currently being discussed at the climate change meeting in, in December at the CBD meeting, let us not forget it is the economy, it's the economy or the economic foundation that provides very, very wrong incentives. Many people say our food system is broken. I think this narrative hides a bigger problem. The economy 
is driving the whole system and the economy behind is broken. So the driver is even bigger. And therefore, I'm happy that uh, my colleague and friend Ulrike uh, is here to talk about life cycle analysis, because we have to look at the economic drivers of the broken system. Our current way to measure it, including GDP, gross domestic product, or looking at yields per hectare only, falls short. We have to have the broader picture, otherwise we are risking to take the wrong activities. And if you look at a report on how much environmental harm was externalized by industry, you see that very often industry can only be profitable because they externalize their costs. And one of the biggest companies externalizing their costs is the food industry. There is a report that the industry has 200 billion US dollars externalities, and this is 224% of their profits. And therefore, my conclusion is there is no business model in the food system currently where the food industry is producing food without externalizing costs. And externalizing costs means other people have to pay for it. Future generations have to, have to pay for it. And we are contributing to the multiple crises we're currently having. So now linking our, this presentation back to climate, transitioning to more sustainable food systems, looking at both supply and demand side measures, has a huge potential to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by around 20% of the emission reductions needed to meet the Paris Agreement. So we are looking at different impacts and different targeted measures. And you see that there's an annual mitigation potential of supply side measures, land use change, lowering agricultural emissions, enhancing carbon sinks. But there's also the demand side, reducing food waste, shifting diets. Why have I introduced the true cost of the system? If we want, for example, to change the way we are using land, we have to look at emissions. But we also have to look at other very important areas, such as biodiversity, water use, and, and, and. And therefore, we need an integrated approach, such as true cost accounting, that allows us to go in the right direction to analyze all costs and to the extent possible, avoid unintended side effects. Now, looking at the economy again, you all know the figure that currently we have 528 billion US dollars of public money spent on agricultural practices, the subsidies for agriculture. And many of these subsidies have very negative impacts on the environment and on climate. And the very rough estimate again said, we would need annually 300 to 350 billion US dollars for actions to transform food systems in an integrated approach. So it is not a question of where does the money come from. The question is, do we have the political will to use parts of the subsidies or to use money from the climate change negotiations to start food systems transformation? And therefore, my key messages at the end are, True cost accounting shows clearly that cheap food is very expensive. Again, we are not talking about increasing food prices. We are analyzing today already existing costs, which are economically invisible. And therefore, true cost accounting can tackle market failure in a different way. It can support the necessary transformation to climate smart agriculture but it also has the integrated approach to look at other important topics such as biodiversity. True cost accounting can support the necessary transformation of food systems by offering a new evalu evaluation framework. That's very important for me. We have to evaluate our work. We know that many people do greenwashing with their standard reporting. I also would like to avoid green wishing so we have to evaluate what we are doing and true cost accounting can offer this new evaluation framework to guide policy making, including budget decisions. And TCA helps to manage 
the complexity of food systems, oh, now I'm going too fast, sorry, managed to, to helps to manage the complexity of food systems and it enables the identification of what needs to change in order to allow nutritious, socially just, sustainable and climate friendly diets for all. And here I'm coming back with my last comment on the first uh, slide. It is complex, but true cost accounting can help us reduce the complex complexity in order to target action and to avoid that doing something good for sector A has unintended negative uh, consequences for sector B. And therefore, it's an integrative approach. And uh, I'm happy that I had the opportunity. And now back to you, Martina, to present it here. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Alexander. And thanks for this excellent presentation, also pointing out the importance of um, the application of TCA if we want to change our food system and also to, uh, to point it out that we need an integrated approach, which is considering the production, but also food loss and waste and diets. And just to point out one point, which I think is really interesting is on the 528 billion subsidies, if we repurpose the subsidies and from harmful to benefit to nature and for action to transform food systems, this would also be a major step forward. And an analysis which has done by the Global Alliance for Future of Food, just as a side remark has shown that only 3% of climate finance is currently going to food systems. That also should alert us and to think about how really to, to move the needle in the right way. Having said this, we will now have a look and discuss the different aspect of TCA and I have an, ex, um, an excellent expert panel. And I will call now my, my three uh, panelists who are in the room. And uh, also we have two panelists outside. Uh, let me start with uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, Amidun. Come to the stage. And I will call you one after another, then it's easier. So um, Ahmed is the Regional Direct uh, Program Coordinator for Disaster Risk Management at the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, Climate Prediction and Application Center. And maybe you could tell us two, three more words about your center. And he will connect uh, building the dots between food security and the TCA, and he will talk about the problems with food insecurity in the Horn of Africa. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, talking to you today. Uh, IGAD is an intergovernmental body in Eastern Africa with uh, eight member countries. Uh, so this center is particularly um, a coalition of eight member countries addressing development issues of food insecurity, but also disaster risk management. Uh, particularly the topic uh, of, uh, or the perspective that I would like to bring in is the issue of food insecurity uh, from the Horn of Africa or Eastern Africa point of view. Uh, as we all know, currently, I think um, quite uh, this Horn of Africa, I think for those of you who don't maybe know about this region is an epitome of crisis, particularly climate crisis, um, starting with COVID, which is a common denominator for all of us, but also floods and droughts, uh, then desert locusts and so on. Uh, critically, what's really important about this is the impacts on food systems and food security. Uh, the current figures are staggering. In a way, uh, the region is uh, one of actually the centers where we have a um, high number of food insecure people. Um, the figures are around 50 million uh, due to these compounding risks, uh, but also cascading impacts. Uh, maybe you might, you might be wondering why uh, this region is so unique in terms of having a large number of uh, food insecure population. Uh, quite a number of underlying factors, uh, but primarily it's basically because of the nature of the livelihoods, which are rain fed, which are basically uh, subsistence in their very nature. Uh, come to the topic of the true cost accounting, one important aspect is, for example, if you look at the desert locust, uh, which 
the desert locust upsurge, uh, what we are talking about is the damage on crops and rangelands, okay? But in fact, the most important cost, which is a hidden cost, as Alexander was saying, is the impacts on the ecosystems, on the species, uh, on the insects, and so on. I think quite a huge pesticide have been applied in this region, uh, and we are still okay um, in terms of uh, the, the, the issue or the problem, you know, uh, subsiding. There is no issue of desert locusts at the moment. So that is, I think, the very important point. It's not only the numbers or the figures of 50 million people in acute food insecurity, but the real damage of those compounding risks is perpetual. For example, to recover from these compounding risks, it doesn't require only to bring back, you know, what has been lost. About 10 million livestock said have been lost. Uh, in this drought, for instance, the real cost is the sustaining the livelihoods, rehabilitating the population, at least back to where they were. So there are quite a number of hidden costs with respect to not only the overall food systems, but also in dealing with the food security. I think I, the way Alexander puts it in terms of or looking at the demand and supply side, as you have seen, the supply side is uh, where we have big potentials compared to the demand side. So what is lacking in the Horn of Africa is the supply side has been devastated due to those compounding risks. One thing which I didn't mention is also the conflict side, protracted conflicts, which affects not only availability, but also access to food. So those are, I think, the perspective which I like to bring. Uh, and thank you very much. And over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, we all know we, have, we don't have one food system and we don't have one solution. So I, listening to you, if you look in the, in the Horn of Africa and talking about we need regional solution, what would be your, your solution? Well, how do you see uh, what is necessary to solve this problem or to avoid um, these problems again? Some of, some of the solutions are regional, uh, particularly what uh, IGAD and uh, the member countries are also doing, uh, more investing or resilience. Uh, I think when you talk of costs, uh, really there are staggering numbers or paradoxes. For example, if you look at the Horn of Africa, the funding rate is increasing, particularly for humanitarian operation. At the same time, the number of people who are food insecure is also increasing. So that means there is something wrong. We are not getting it or we are moving in circles. Humanitarian emergencies subsiding, then we go back and again and again. That's over the last 40, 50 years, okay? So uh, the key, I think, uh, solutions are more of regional, particularly to try to transform uh, uh, the food systems, starting with uh, community-based resilience approaches. Uh, one thing I think about the food, uh, the, the true cost accounting is that it's all calling towards investing more on resilience. Uh, particularly climate resilience as compared to managing the crisis, which will keep us in a perpetual emergency. I think for that region, uh, the solution is more of more investments, more uh, finances uh, to local solutions, particularly in transforming uh, and diversifying uh, the food systems. But also it's global, particularly such avenues like climate discussions, climate justice. The central point of that is how can we protect the livelihoods and the food systems in those most vulnerable regions. That's what, for me, that's what is damage and loss is all about. How can we protect the most vulnerable who have contributed the least to the climate crisis? That is, I think, uh, the central point which I would like to carry. So, you, so you left us still with a lot of house which we have to discuss and to solve. But just, I think it's important really what we have is we need to invest in this climate resilient actions. And what I take out also of here, we need more finance. And at the end, we have to find the solutions. And I think we have to find the solutions, especially also in these dialogues. And looking at the COP this year, we have started the dialogue and to integrate food and food systems in the overall discussion of the climate COP. Yeah, we have, I think, three, 400 events just dealing with food. We never had this before. And I think this is already a strong message on food system transformation, which is urgent needed. I want now to invite my second panelist, Joao Campari, uh, to, he's the global leader of our WWF food program. 
He also was the chair of UN Food System Summit Action Track 3 on boosting nature positive production. Um, he will talk about the role of food system and diets in the context of TCA. Joe, over to you and also maybe a little bit reflecting what you have seen here at the COP and I think it would maybe be interesting also for those who are not here, also Alexander, Kathleen and Ulrike and just to hear a little bit what's happening here at the COP this year in the context of food systems, which I think is super encouraging and exciting. Working out, yes. Uh, what's happening at this COP? I am a Brazilian and I'm in Egypt and I'm freezing in this room. <laughs> this is what's happening uh, in this COP to start with. So I'm, I'm talking and I'm shivering here. Um, but in the context of, of diets, when we talk about food systems and diets, we actually need to talk about diets within the context of sustainable food systems. What, 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 does have, what, what is that all about? Alexander showed us that in his introductory remarks that food systems, the way we're currently, they are currently structured, impose externalities. And we, I'm an environmental economist, and we economists have three ways of dealing uh, with the internalization of these externalities. One is through market mechanisms, price, taxes, or subsidies in some cases. Um, then uh, we also have legislation, which we call command and control. And if you are an institutional economist, we can rearrange uh, things in, in, and, and think about the food systems in terms of, of governance. But as Alexander also pointed out, pointed out, the economics of the food system is broken. Right, because we are not only taking from nature, farmers and fishers of the world are not taking from nature because they want to. I mean, they are economic agents that need to uh, be incentivized to, to produce. So, and the current incentives that many farmers and fishers have come from the subsidies, right? That are harmful to uh, nature and to people. One of these externalities that is generally not talked about is that climate change is impacting and reducing the nutritional density of crops, right? So, um, and in a world where 75% of our calories come from 12 plants and five animals, this is very important because the whole value chain and in fact, the supply chain architecture of our food system is, is, is designed around this 12 plus five of all the plant varieties that are there available for food, of all uh, the animals that uh, are available that can be eaten, we are relying on very few of both. This makes our food systems rather homogeneous. Uh, and at WWF, we work to uh, promote what we call agrobiodiversity. We need to expand the mix so that there will be less pressure on our natural resources. And uh, we also work on repurposing harmful subsidies under a just rural transition. So um, in, in a planet with resource constraints, in a planet that I think it's today that, reach, that, 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 that has like 8 billion people, so it, it, um, it turned, and in a planet where we are producing food already for 10 billion people, it's, it's unacceptable that in terms of diet and, and, and nutrition, that about 10% of the planet, more than 10%, suffer from chronic hunger. This means they don't get enough calories, right? Now, I keep seeing uh, innovations coming up, right? There are all sorts of innovations from um, uh, new types of food, lab-grown food, and all of that. But what happens when these new types of food enter the, a system that is broken? Are these solutions if we don't fix the problem of uh, hunger first, the problem of obesity, the problem of food loss and waste, the problems of gender? If we don't fix the systemic lock-ins that keep the food system as it is, we will continue to see 
an expansion of these externalities. We are beyond the boundaries of our planet in many ways. There are trade-offs and we are not, we are talking fast enough, but we are not acting fast enough. And one of the things that I think from the institutional and governance perspective of the food system that is happening with Coronivia. Uh, Coronivia is the only official arm, I, I would say, of the UNFCCC that deals with food, right? Mostly it's about agriculture. But food is not about agriculture or aquaculture or about food production alone. It's about consumption. It's about healthy diets from these sustainable food systems. It's about reducing food loss and food waste to, to, the, to, to the extent that we can, probably to the extent that we can't. So we need to reduce this more and more, right? So if Coronivia and if UN, uh, UNFCCC do not embrace a systemic approach to food. There is no way that we are going to put the planet, as far as the food system is concerned, on a 1.5 degree pathway. And the 1.5 the 1.5 degree, by the way, is not a target. It's a limit. So you know, we, we, it's not a target that we can reach. We need to probably stay way beyond it. But this needs to be really understood. We can't push planetary boundaries, because this will have impact on nature, on climate, and on people. So we should be here. There is a lot of cacophony in, in the pavilion, but I think that this is the cacophony that we're uh, listening and hearing in the food system. We, not, we need to cut across this noise. We need to roll up our sleeves and, and, and begin to work. We need to you know, we need to enable kids. I, I told you, I come from Brazil, and the, the, sometimes you are in these villages, fishing villages, where it's, it's, it's easier and cheaper to buy a bag of potato chips in a, in a store than eat fish. I mean, so the whole thing is, is sort of perverse. You know, sometimes food is not accessible, the right types of food. Sometimes they are not affordable. And when both are available and affordable, they are probably not desirable. So we need to focus when we talk about diets and this food system within the climate context, we need to think really carefully about the economics of it. Thank you, Martina. Thank you, Joao, and also, Two points. Thank you, first of all, once again, pointing out the importance and uh, to really get a strong uh, mandate for the future of Coronivia. And uh, if we won't manage to get uh, the food system in the new Coronivia, it would be a huge failure. And as Joe mentioned, agriculture is the only sector which is mentioned under the UNFCCC convention. So everybody has the possibility to influence. Please go ahead. The second thing, what you mentioned, what makes me thinking about is about all these innovations, yeah? And um, these innovations also on food and what it would mean uh, if we consider it under the aspect of true, of true cost accounting. I think this is something also as a takeaway to think about and to discuss further the true costs of all the innovations which are coming and popping up and which we have learned or let get known about running or walking around here uh, through all the pavilions. I would do like to ask uh, my third panelist, Roy Steiner, to uh, our panel. He is the senior vice president for the food initiatives at the Rockefeller Foundation. And I learned that you lead a team focused on creating for more nutrition, regenerative and equitable food. And I know, yes, you have a PowerPoint presentation. I think it will work. Maybe we could step up a little bit so that people could see your presentation and over to you. Great, thank you so much. I, I agree with Zhao that it is freezing in here and it's such an example of uh, wasting resources. Everybody, and we, we have a food system that is wasting resources to deliver something that a lot of us don't want. Um, I only have four slides and I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time on them, but I thought I Alexander did such a great job uh, laying out um, you know, what cost accounting is. Um, the only thing I would, hold on. The only thing I would want to say is in all the different dimensions, there are some dimensions that are more easily valued than others. 
Uh, and yet, just because something is not value, not easily economically valued, doesn't mean that it's not important. Uh, so, for example, animal welfare is often not put into truth cost accounting, but I think it has value. It's very difficult to value, whereas some of the healthcare costs are very easy to value uh, and are always there. Um, we did a, an analysis of um, uh, the U.S. food system, uh, which is very similar to what uh, Alec, Alexander mentioned in terms of the globe, and, and uh, came with a very similar conclusion. Uh, what's interesting about this is that almost, uh, all, every, almost every true cost accounting analysis at a national or global level shows similar amounts, uh, uh, comes to similar conclusions. We are, right now, the U.S. food system spends about uh, one, $1.1 trillion on, on food, but conservatively uh, creates over $2 trillion worth of measurable economic uh, costs. So we, we have essentially, as Alexander mentioned, created a value-destroying food system. And who wants to be part of a value-destroying sector? I think we have to change that. The other point on this slide is the two trillion is those are the things that we actually can measure, yet there are many things we think we cannot measure that are still important. And even if you just estimate that, that almost doubles it. So um, it, it makes it even more dire. The question, of course, is what do you do with this uh, information? Um, we had three government departments, um, the Office of Management Budget, USDA, actually call us up after we published this um, uh, report to get a debriefing and, and their, their issue was, this is all very help, it's, it's interesting, but how do we apply it? And so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the measures we've done to uh, help cre create a change. I'll get out of the way here. We analyzed the school lunch program in the United States, uh, which uh, the US spends about $18 billion on school lunches, feeding about 30 million uh, children. Um, and when you talk to policymakers, they think of it as a cost. But when you actually use true cost accounting, it creates $20 billion worth of value, economic value to the US economy. Um, and with just a few changes could create another $10 billion. So it's a very different way of thinking about something that people are uh, you know, always trying to cut. Uh, and with this perspective, you're like, you are actually destroying value by cutting the school food program rather than sa uh, quote unquote saving money. So I think that's, this is one example of how it could be used in, in policy discussions. Um, the second thing is an uh, area is we um, have been funding, it's not yet complete, an analysis of the India's public distribution system. Uh, so, uh, and it is the largest, uh, purchaser of food in the world uh, when it, um, and it serves about 800 million people uh, using a, a minimum surprise, uh, support uh, price system. We have um, funded the Tata Cornell Institute for Agriculture and Nutrition to do this analysis. And what they have come up, and this is the first time anybody is seeing this, by the way, um, the current uh, Indian PDS costs about $13 billion but once again, conservatively creates $5 trillion worth of environmental costs and um, about $1, uh, $1 billion worth of uh, human health costs. We can actually mitigate that by making some very important and relatively simple changes, more diversified crops um, uh, uh, grown in, in a more regionally and locally based way. And so you can actually eliminate that, that extra $5 billion uh, if, you had, if, you, if we change that. So, um, and let me just give you two more, we can get rid of, this is done. Um, uh, we, can, we can go back to the main slide. Um, uh, let, let me just finish by saying there's two other examples. Um, we're doing the analysis of school meals in Kenya uh, where, um, I'll, you can come back up uh, on, the, on the stage, um, uh, where we we're showing that doing simple things like moving from refined grains to whole grains creates a tremendous amount of value. Um, you know, traditionally, we have used 
Um, refined grains, 30 years ago, it made a lot of sense to have refined grains uh, because whole grains only had a shelf life of about four weeks. Now we have milling technologies that enable whole grains to be um, uh, six to 12 months shelf life. Um, so when you move from refined to whole grains, you get 20 to 30% more food. You know, that's what happens when you refine, you actually get rid of a lot, 20 to 30% uh, of the, and you have five times the nutritional quality. All right. And it costs less. So, I mean, it's a, it, it, the food system is stuck in old ways and on, and, and based on old assumptions, and we need to really be transformational. And just by making that shift, you save millions and millions of dollars uh, in each of these, uh, the, the economies that we've looked at. Do I have one more minute? Okay. The final um, example I wanted to show, show, share was, um, a, in many ways, the procurement rules, these kind of archaic, detailed rules are actually where a lot of value gets locked in. In New York State, for example, um, New York State buys about $2 billion worth of food for its schools, for prisons, for hospitals. Um, by law, they have to buy it uh, based on minimum price, which is very common in most procurement processes. That means that if Chinese apples or Washington State apples are one cent less than New York State apples, they have to buy those apples, which you know, every, everybody knows New York is the big op apple. It's a New York, yeah, it's an apple state. Um, uh, because people are not thinking about all the transportation costs, the regional economy costs, that, I mean, it's just, it makes no sense. A lot of these procurement processes, they're based on very narrow understanding of systems and, and, and real value. So we have to go in state by state, city by city, community by community, to really start changing these rules and really uh, making a difference if we want to do the transformation of these systems. So I'll leave you there. There's lots of really excellent work out there. And I really appreciate uh, the co-panelists and Alexander, your, um, uh, your, your presentation was fantastic. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Roy. I, I'm really impressed of your example. It's very, very exciting and very interesting. So if I would have one more question on you, um, how do you go ahead with the results now? So you have exciting results from, from the school mill, um, from the Indian case. What would you be your, your next step on this, really to, to get this kind of transformative processes? Um, well, the... Um work with partners to educate and inform policymakers. Um, as a private foundation, we are not allowed to lobby, so <laughs> we do not do that. Okay, so this leads me maybe to uh, my next speaker, who is more connected also to governments or has been connected to governments. Um, I want to introduce uh, now uh, uh, Kathleen Merrigan. She's online. Yes, I see her. She is professor and executive director of the Sweetie Center for Sustainable uh, Food System at the Arizona State University. And thanks for being here in the early mornings. And from 2009 to 2013, uh, Kathleen was the deputy secretary at the COO of the US Department for Agriculture. We heard a lot about TCA, but it would be really interesting. And that was my question to Roy, and now I put it on to you, Kathleen. How can TCA be embedded into government decisions and that government decisions maybe go in the right direction? Just the example of the procurement rules. So over to you, and thanks for participating today. Thanks so much. Well, good morning, everybody. It's nice and warm here in Arizona, as it usually is. Don't want to make you jealous. Um, just to begin, I want to thank Olivia Reimer from TMG for helping us organize the panel and note that Nadia Hog Shalaba and Mauricio Bellin, who work with me on TCA, are in the Zoom audience. So first, I just want to say that I'm seeing businesses pick up TCA. In our own work at the Sweetie Center, we have a project ongoing with Mitsubishi looking at comparative analysis of oils with Starbucks looking at milk and um, the alternatives to milk. 
Uh, I am involved with a venture capital firm, Astronor, and we're using true cost accounting to um, help our portfolio companies make better decisions and to help us evaluate our own impact of our investments. So I'm seeing this take up in the private sector that I think is really very positive. But your question is absolutely right. And it does follow on to Roy's presentation. How do we get the government to embed TCA in governmental decision-making processes? So my idea has been, and and some people have heard me say this before, um, we should make the case, and I believe it's a smart thing to do and accurate, to describe TCA as a modern and improved variant of cost-benefit analysis. I find in my experience, government folk, and I'm one of them, uh, really like to see things that they're comfortable with, embrace things that they're comfortable with. So by presenting uh, TCA as a cost-benefit evolution, there's a comfort level there. Now, that's disappointing to some of my colleagues who want to say TCA is a brand new thing, um, because that sounds more exciting. But um, I love this book, Thinking in Time. It's an old, uh, old policy book. And what the authors say, Neustadt and May, is it's really important when you look at policy to research the history of idea because so many ideas are really not new and to learn from that history. So I have taken that to heart and I've really been investigating the use of cost benefit analysis over time to figure out what are the ways to um, learn from those experiences and make TCA the better version. Um, They're both methodologies intended to fully describe and make transparent the costs and benefits associated with proposed decisions and aid decision-making. To the extent that they differ, it is mainly in the scope of analysis with TCA having a much wider lens To the extent that they are the same, both are subject to various objections to monetizing certain things based on ethical or moral grounds. So I am from the States. I've had this experience at USDA. And I thought to myself, well, we do cost benefit analysis in the United States rulemaking processes. But is this, are we standalone or is this being used across the globe? And when I looked, I, investigated the Society for Cost-Benefit Analysis that was established in 2007. It has members from 35 different countries. I noticed in 2014, the EC published a how-to guide to appraise their investments using TCA. So I think this is um, suggesting that CBA is a known and accepted tool across many parts of the globe. So let's, let's use that as the baseline and figure we can build from there. So what have been the experiences in CBA that have been challenging? And while some of us got discouraged by CBA and wanted something new, well, first it is plagued, has been plagued over the years of practice by knowledge gaps. And um, TCA doesn't solve that. As we advocate for TCA, we also have to advocate for uh, robust, publicly available, government-supported data Um, sources, because that's going to make the whole uh, analysis good. We need to recognize that monetizing benefits are more difficult than monetizing costs. I think Roy hinted to this, and certainly we've seen this in the whole approach to biodiversity, which is so so many times invisible. Um, There's overwhelming complexity. At the Sweetie Center, we're doing a project on cow-calf operations in the West, trying to assess the true costs. And we've got models and data and all kinds of complexity. We have a very thick report. So we have to figure out how to get around that. And a lot of times in governmental decision-making, governments use CBA to justify a policy decision that's already been made, as opposed to using it upfront or at least in parallel with the decision-making to influence uh, what's being decided. So those are some things that I keep in the uh, top of my head when I'm thinking about uh, how we move forward with TCA and how we get it embedded in governmental decision-making. 
I think talking about this at COP27, having this um, conversation today, it's very timely. Um, I think that it's um, important to embed TCA in U.S. rulemaking. And I'm really heartened to hear that Roy had some of those calls from government uh, um, entities. I have too, because I've published some articles on TCA. So we definitely see uh, certain members of the U.S. governmental administrative bodies interested in TCA and exploring its use. Wouldn't it be great if all governments embedded TCA in their governmental accounting? I think this is possible. I think there are enough studies that have been done uh, about how to do uh, TCA. Um, they need to continue, but I think we're at the point where we have sufficient evidence that it's the right way to go. I'm just going to say uh, as a last point, I mentioned to you that it's morning time in Arizona. I'm sure several of you, if not all of you, have been watching the U.S. elections. They have been tumultuous, and there has been a lot of focus on election deniers. Kathleen, what does this have to do with TCA? Well, here's, here's my thought this morning. Um, people are anxious that they're not being told the whole truth that there are elites out there hiding critical information. Do I believe this? Uh, no, I do not. Is there evidence of it? I do not think so. But I do take it as a signal that people want more transparency from government. TCA provides that transparency. So maybe this is a conversation that goes beyond assessing the true cost of food and it's really about improved decision-making, sharing with the public everything that needs to be known and moving forward with civil society in a positive way. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Kathleen. I, I think it's really good to hear from you once again. Uh, first of all, I understood we still have uh, a knowledge gap, we need maybe even more research. But at the same time, we want governments to react. And my question, and maybe this is my, and also you talked about the, the point of having more transparency. So how could we accelerate this process or help governments to make the right decision and to really integrate the TCA in their thinking? Maybe one quick answer on this. So I think we just, uh, like in my, in the U.S. context, which is my playground, I think we pick uh, two or three rules in the Biden administration, and we do side-by-side -side analyses, CBA and TCA, and um, show policymakers what TCA can reveal that they are missing, that they may want to consider. We could do this on active rulemaking, or we can do it retrospectively. We can look back at some of, of the key rules, like I was involved with the decision to accelerate the lines in poultry processing plants. Had we done TCA as opposed to CBA, maybe we would have revealed more of the harms that workers uh, encountered in terms of their health. Uh, uh, and maybe we would have had a different decision. So I, I think that's uh, the way to go in the short term to really have some strong proof points for government. Thank you. Thank you. Very strong messages. Thanks a lot. And I come now to our um, next speaker, once again, online, Ulrike Eberle. She is a managing partner of Corsus GmbH. It's a sustainability consultancy that advises companies, municipalities, and organizations. She's working, working very closely also with WWF Germany on a project which is called Climate Impact on Food. And in her presentation today, she will explain us a little bit more the interrelation between true cost accounting and life cycle assessment, because there is very often a confusion. How does it link together? And over to you, uh, Ulrike, uh, to show your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Martina, very much for your introduction. Um, I will share my presentation and I hope you can, oops, you can see it. 
Is it fine as it is right now? Yeah. It's good. Appreciate yeah, thank you very much. So uh, thank you um, as well for all organizers in particular. I'd like to thank Olivia for her, for the invitation and also for the very excellent organize, uh, organization of this session. As the last speaker, as uh, Martina already mentioned, um, I will uh, talk um, on LCA and uh, because LCA is somewhat the basis of TCA and probably also other evaluation tools. So first, um, I like to um, tell you a bit, uh, what is life cycle assessment? The abbreviation is LCA, but what is it? It's a method uh, uh, to, to estimate environmental, but also social impacts related to any kind of system. Could be a product. Um, so we talk about ELCA, which is environmental LCA, but also social LCA, which is um, uh, where the abbreviation is SLCA. And um, all inputs um, into that system and all outputs from the system are accounted for um, along, for example, a product's life cycle. And uh, these impacts can be, or, or these inputs and outputs can be material flows, as you already uh, know, for example, uh, in, um, input of fossil energy and you have an output um, of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that's something LCA accounts for, but also can be the input of working hours or the um, and then the impact on working conditions, etc. If you have a look at social conditions. So that's what LCA is about. And um, LCA has about 50 years of history. I just put it here shortly together for you. Uh, the methodological development started in the in the early 1970s. And uh, in the late um, 1980s, we had the first steps regarding standardization, which um, or the harmonization of the different methods, methods which uh, have been proposed. And this um, harmonization work was guided by the Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, the so-called CTAC. And therefore, you often hear CTAC in the context of LCA. And they ended up with uh, the first guidelines, which was the code of practice in 1993. And uh, uh, directly after that, uh, guidelines had been finished. Um, an international standardization process started uh, with the participation of 40 countries. And it resulted in the ISO 1440 series uh, for the environmental LCA, which is put here on the, on the left-hand side, the both standards. And for social LCA, the development started somewhat later. And I think the first um, guidelines we had in 2006 and uh, the latest ones um, are dated um, in 2020. So, um, we have an international standard on that. And as I already said, LCA uh, forms the basis uh, for evaluation approaches because LCA ends up normally with the impact assessment results. I put you on the left-hand side a picture which uh, comes from, from the standard, from the ISO standard. Uh, we have a clear framework where life cycle assessment has to follow. We define the goal and scope. Uh, we carry out an inventory analysis. The inventory analysis is the part where the um, material flows, for example, are calculated for, and you end up, for example, with uh, the, the amount of water used um, for uh, the uh, production of that food or whatever. And then we carry out an impact assessment, which is uh, that we calculate, for example, the impact that water use has for that ecosystem, for example, for in respect uh, to water scarcity. So that's uh, what LCA is doing, but then LCA stops. You know, you have the impact assessment results and they are interpreted and everything like that, but um, they are not evaluated. And these evaluation approaches, for example, true cost accounting, uh, make use of the results of LCA. So it's not only true cost accounting, we also have several other um, evaluation approaches, for example, one um, SDG evaluation of products, where an evaluation with respect to the SDG, the, uh, the contribution to the SDG is, evalu is evaluated. 
or also all kind of uh, communication tools. For example, um, environmental labels for food. I put you here some recent developments from uh, from France, which is a planet score or, what, uh, or the eco score um, below. They also have as a basis um, LCA. And also the communication tool, Martina already mentioned that we are part of a project with the WWF uh, Germany and also TMG on the climate impacts of food. And there we try to or we will develop a communication tool and also here the basis forms LCA. So what is doing true cost accounting? It takes um, the LCI and LCIA results, for example, uh, from a food uh, product, and then you have a kind of monetary evaluation and um, you account for the real prices of foods. Alexander already uh, mentioned that and um, already explained that quite clearly. So um, you have a, in the end, you end up with a real price of that food product. And I think that's quite good also for communication, but also for policy making to see what are the real costs um, of that food production or of that food system. So um, for sure, we have uh, still some um, development needs in LCA. Um, we have some methodological issues which still need to be tackled. Um, for example, for biodiversity impact assessment, there are some developments recently ongoing. We have already some um, assessment methods which are proposed and under discussion. Same for water scarcity, for example, at the U European Union level, we have um, kind of um, joint understanding how we calculate that, but we, already, we still know that it has to be further developed. Same as for tox toxicological impacts. But for example, the quantification of um, climate impacts, uh, global warming potential is already quite robust. And I think that's a great achievement also of the of the climate um, community uh, that we all understand what is global warming potential, what is GVP 100, and um, that there yeah there are still some people uh, neglecting the existence of climate change, but all nearly all people understand we have climate change, we have to act on that, and we can quantify it by using the global warming potential. We also have some lack of databases, but uh, the message here is clear. Um, despite of all these methodological issues, it's already possible to act on the basis of results. And I put you here on the right side, the logo of the last um, food LCA, International Food LCA Conference, where, for example, these methodological issues still to be tackled are under discussion. Yeah, we, we had that um, international conference um, in October this year in Lima. And for example, there have been a lot of sessions on biodiversity impact assessment. We discussed water scarcity, but also toxicological impacts. But um, the most important thing is, despite all these methodological issues, we can and we have to use the results um, and to act uh, in order to achieve more sustainable food systems. So um, to end up, um, we know we already know a lot about food systems, and I don't think that I have to repeat all the findings, but probably here some of the most important ones. Uh, we know, for example, that animal foods uh, cause higher impacts uh, than plant-based products. Yeah, we already have some recommendations for a diet for a healthy planet, uh, the, uh, the recommendations of the Eat Lancet Commission. And for example, we calculated these um, uh, uh, these um, the impacts result. If you follow uh, the recommendation of the Eat, Land uh, Eat Lancet Commission, we calculated the resulting environmental impacts for some scenarios for German diet, and we could quite clearly show we could quite clearly show that um, if you switch to a flexitarian diet with less meat and with less animal products, or to even a vegetarian or vegan diet, you can. Um, clearly reduce uh, the environmental impacts. For example, with respect to climate change, you can nearly half the, uh, the environmental impact when switching to a vegetarian or vegan diet within uh, the planetary or with, um, with following the, the recommendations of the planetary health diet. Um, however, um, we have to uh, broaden our uh, view and not just take climate impacts into account because food is much more than just climate. 
And Martina already started um, with um, this session and said we also have, for example, a biodiversity crisis and we also have to tackle these issues and we have to take it um, into account. And to end up, um, life cycle assessment and for sure also true cost accounting are quite helpful tools. Uh, TCA in particular also for policies because it's easily understandable. Um, but um, as already said, also from my um, from my previous speakers, um, we have to break down that to a um, community level. We have to work with municipalities, um, which was already mentioned. And so I think uh, one of the guiding principles for the necessarily uh, the necessary transformation of food systems to sustainable food systems should be that sustainable choices must be easy choices. So thank you very much. And thank you, Ulrike. Thank you also for once again pointing out that we have to consider also the biodiversity impact. And we are just three weeks away from the biodiversity conference in Montreal, where we will discuss about uh, the global, uh, global framework uh, for biodiversity. And it's really important to, to think about this and how we could integrate the biodiversity more on these reflections. I have one short question uh, concerning your last sentence. You said uh, that it is sustainable choices must be easy choices. What's your idea on, on getting in the way to make an easy choice? What's my idea to, to get an easy choice? Yeah, I think we need more transparency in the, within the food systems. I think it's also a point which was already mentioned. And we need also tools to make it easier um, for producers, but also for consumers uh, to get the information needed to make, for example, in, uh, informed choices. Uh, for I can say that for Germany and probably for many other countries also involved in the Cliff project, that's not possible at the moment. You can in Germany you can see it's a organically produced product uh, or it's not or it's fair traded perhaps, but that's it. Yeah, but uh, there are many more differences and um, yes I think you need that um, information you need we need more transparency that's one big issue uh, to get more easy uh, easier choices or to enable easier choices and as I already said we have to um, act on the community level we have to act uh, we have to work together with uh, municipalities uh, to get sustainable food systems implemented um, there in the yeah in the structures and in the thinking, for example, food shed thing, thinking, and so on. So that's uh, from my point of view the way we have to go for the transformation. And as I already said, LCA, but also TCA is a quite important and helpful tool for that. Thank you, Ulrike. So I think we have maybe one time for one question is there are there any questions from the participants here two questions okay i take the two yeah uh my name's john willis i work for an ngo called planet tracker we're very interested in food systems um actually very simple question um how do you get this implemented? So what we've heard, absolutely fascinating panel, and thank you very much, everyone. Really, really interesting. But what we keep hearing is external, externalities are not priced in. Of course, corporates don't want them priced in. They want them as far away as possible. Municipalities don't want extra costs. How do we make this happen? I think we just... Cluster the two questions, collect the two questions. Yeah, over okay. to you. Uh, my name is uh, Jerome Remmers from uh, the True Animal Protein Price Coalition. So we are in the uh, field of uh, true pricing uh, animal products like meat and dairy. So my question would also be, uh, what, what can governments do to uh, have this true price really implemented maybe in tax systems? And uh, can uh, sustainable and healthy food products uh, become cheaper by subsidizing them or reducing fat tariffs uh, like the EU Commission uh, Parliament also asked to do? Thank you. So who wants to answer the questions? Just 
Kathleen and Alexander, wonderful. Who wants to start? I'll start really quickly and, and Alexander will do more in depth. But quickly, I wanna say, and I usually say at the top of every speech I give on TCA, the goal here is not to make food more expensive for people who are going to the grocery, right? <laughs> even, uh, even in the US, um, there's so many people struggling with hunger and inflation right now. Um, the point is a transparency for decision makers, both in the public and the private sector, so that they can, just as you say, make different decisions about uh, policies how to implement them and steer us in a different course. Over to you, Alexander. Thanks a lot, Kathleen. Uh, would like to try to answer John's question, how do we implement it? Three brief examples. We can tell food companies that today's externalities are tomorrow's risks. If they degrade land, Sooner or later, they will have not enough fertile land and therefore their business model is at risk. So it's kind of a risk management tool where companies with a longer term interest have to look at what are the consequences of the producing cheap food today. Second, I would like to come back to what my colleague and friend uh, Ahmed has, has told us. The fact that the region for which he is responsible is suffering so much requires investment and true cost accounting can tell you how expensive inaction is. People will suffer a lot. It will cost a huge amount of money. And therefore, TCA can guide investment and can tell people precautionary measures are a lot cheaper. And least but not last, I, I, I would like to come back to what Roy has presented. We should avoid that we want to monetize everything. If there is a modern form of slavery, it doesn't make sense to monetize it and to put a higher price on it. We have to act by ending modern forms of slavery. And therefore, let's also talk about the limitations of true cost accounting. It's not a silver bullet, but we can use it in various forms and it can be a powerful tool if we apply it in a coherent way across climate, biodiversity, but also social issues and human health issues. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Alexander. Anybody up? I just wanted to add an insight. I think, um, you know, the, we cannot depart from the assumption that everything works in, under normal conditions. I mean, there are many countries that I know of, <laughs> um, I name them, but, you know, that there is uh, explicit rent seeking behavior everywhere, right? So there is, a, a, there is no governance. Uh, institutions, uh, the institutional framework does not work, and due to, to abuses uh, of encroaching on nature deliberately. So, uh, you know, rent-seeking behavior is a really, really nasty thing. So if we don't bring the governance aspects into this equation of TCA or CBA, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to, to resolve this because we're not dealing with only externalities. It's a, a whole institutional change that needs to happen for TCA and for the food system to, to, to function, actually. Just wanted to make that remark. Thanks, Martina. And I just have one um, suggestion that we've been talking about. At every UN event, we should have the true price on uh, when you're buying food, right? Like, it's crazy that we can go in and Let's have everybody talking about food so that here at COP, and, uh, and let's try to get it at COP28, you have the, the price and then the true price, and then, have, and then everybody's going to be walking around asking that question. We need to raise the level of awareness. And I think if FAO did it in their headquarters, we should do it at our headquarters. Uh, it would actually be a, a helpful uh, change. It's, it's a great idea and maybe next year we will also have a little bit more delicious and healthy food and with a true here, cost here. accounting <laughs> that would be great. So I now want like, to introduce our last speaker and for the closing and I'm very happy to have Fiakel here from Germany. He's the head of the division Europeans and international adaptation of climate at the German uh, federal ministry for and now am I micro? No, it's still working and Sorry, we always have problems with the micros. 
Uh, and Ulf also, maybe um, we are at the currently WWF Germany is working uh, financed by the Ministry for Environment on a project which is called um, the uh, global impact of food. And what we want to achieve in this project is also to make an easier choice. So just having said this, Ulf, over to you to make the closing of our session. And uh, yeah, great to have you in our uh, Tukosa County event. Yeah, thank you very much, Martina. And uh, thank you and WWF colleagues and the colleagues from uh, TMG and also courses for uh, organizing this. Um, uh, I have been to COP uh, last week and I've seen uh, how much attention to uh, these uh, uh, food-related issues uh, are, is given. So this is a, a very positive sign. Yeah, you mentioned our, uh, our project climate impact of food. That was... Uh, um, we, we sat together and we, we developed an idea to develop a tool, uh, to uh, a global tool uh, for the information on the climate impacts of, of food. We are still in the development process, um, but um, uh, we are very optimistic that this tool will help uh, not only consumers, but also um, governments, uh, retailers, uh, food companies, uh, canteen and restaurant managers to uh, provide better choices. The better choices should be the easier choice. Yes, that's right. And uh, yes, TCA is a, is a fascinating uh, tool because money is the is the uh, uh, currency, so to say, uh, which everybody understands. So uh, this is something which is uh, easy to communicate and not only to consumers, of course, but also to, uh, to governments and to, uh, uh, to retailers and others. And, and I fully share the view of Alexander Müller that uh, uh, companies have to, to act um, because that's, that's the risk also. Uh, the risk uh, in, in, in the future because the, uh, the, 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 the raw material will not be there if they don't take any, any measures, also an adaptation. Um, so, and uh, that's the same for, uh, for governments who have to ensure food security. Um, that's, uh, that's right. So measuring is, is necessary uh, and also providing uh, credible information is, is absolutely necessary, but they are also not only to, uh, to consumers. Consumers can't be left alone uh, with that. They have to uh, be given uh, the, the good choices. And the, the figures Alexander Müller uh, presented, when I look at the, the government side, and I'm uh, uh, working for the government for, for quite a while now, uh, I mean, I quite... Um, yeah, should should be a very convincing that uh, the um, uh, the money spent for um, uh, in the in the food sector is not uh, very well spent if there are external costs uh, coming coming with that. So, uh, looking at an instrument like true cost accounting uh, to um, to have to make better decisions and to to direct the this money. Uh, in uh, to to different practices uh, that is absolutely necessary and uh, necessary also uh, from just the pure economical view of our national economy. So this is uh, definitely uh, uh, something which has to be uh, changed in the in the future. Yes, I know. Uh, having worked in in this area for uh, also for for some time. Um, <clears throat> using TCA in the daily practice of public procurement, for example, is not that easy. Our procurement uh, law in, in Germany requires that to a certain extent, but I know that the people uh, doing the um, uh, procurement uh, tenders and, uh, and, and the procurement work uh, on the ground, uh, they are they have uh, some problems with, with putting that into uh, for the with the implementation. Still, uh, there is no other choice. They they have to they have to do it uh, also for the sake of uh, of the national uh, economy. So um, I think the discussion has shown that there are a, a lot of challenges, but there is also 
um, uh, that there are also tools out there like TCA, which can can help to do uh, to to make better decisions uh, also from from the government side, and that will of course influence the whole uh, the whole process uh, from uh, food companies to retailers to management uh, of restaurants and canteens and to the consumer. So that has to be done. And um, uh, yes, the political will. Um, is, um, I would say that not there to a full extent, but uh, uh, giving the uh, the importance uh, which uh, is attached here at the at the COP, or at, at you at the COP, uh, it's uh, uh, it, it, it's some somewhat uh, optimistic, and I hope uh, that will also uh, be the case uh, in the biodiversity COP in, in, in some weeks. So thanks uh, uh, again to WWF, TNG courses, and uh, to all the uh, the panelists, all the speakers, and uh, to the audience. Thanks very much, and uh, yeah, have a lot of success at uh, at COP for the coming days. Thank you. Thanks, Ulf, and. Thanks for all the participants. Take the energy with you for the next days and hopefully to see some of you, everybody in Montreal to once again lobby for food system in the new global biodiversity framework.